Welcome on in, golf fans. It's your boy, GS Luke, here with our course preview for this week's Mexico Open. Going to break down Vedanta Vallarta, bring you all the info that you need to get your research process started for DFS and for betting to help make some of your choices for this week and get your research process started. So we'll take a look at the course, go over some of the details, make sure we're all on the same page, go through a whole-by-whole -whole breakdown, look at some of the shots that these players are going to be facing, and then towards the end, why most of you guys are here, we'll take Take a look at some of my key stats in my modeling for this week over there on Bet the Number to get an idea for the types of players that you might want to keep an eye on for all of your exposure. So a lot to get into here. It's a weaker field event, which means a little bit more digging that we're going to have to do. Let's go ahead and hop right on in. My apologies if the voice sounds a little bit scratchy, but still recovering from the illness last week and uh, didn't even have my voice yesterday. So wasn't entirely sure if we'd be able to do content here on Monday, but luckily have at least recovered a little bit and uh, can bring you guys this preview, which for Vedanta Vallarta, they've got a Greg Norman design, a little bit longer for a par 71 and for a resort style golf course um, like we have for this week, it plays a little bit more difficult than you'd probably expect as well. So a few things to note, we're down in Mexico, we have wide open past Palum fairways. So kind of similar to what we had at De Monte, which of course was the Tiger Woods design that we played in the fall. It's wide open. It's got a little bit of length to it. It plays firmer and faster because of the swale down there in Mexico. But what makes this golf course, I think, a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging than what we had at De Monte is that the greens have a little bit more oomph to them. They've got a little bit more um, slope on them, a little bit more undulation than what we have over there at the other golf course. And on top of that, you've got some difficult around the green shots. You've got some elevated greens. You've got some bunkers right, at a lot of Greg Norman designs. Uh, you get a whole lot of bunkering around them. And they're actually pretty difficult around this track. So rather than being that putting contest that we get at a lot of resort style golf courses, this one's a lot more ball striking heavy. And if we take a look at the leaderboard over the last few years, um, you'll see that with the results, right? I mean, John Rom, Tony Finau, one and two. For the last two seasons, Brandon Wu up there, guys like Batia, Cole, Grio, all known as ball strikers. Um, you go through this top 10, top 20, whether it's last year or the year before, and you find a lot of guys that are known for their iron play. So, you know, obviously those top two are the best examples, but Brandon Wu showing up again, Cameron Champ, David Lipsky, Alex Smalley, um, all known as some of the better iron players on tour. Um, it's not the strongest field that you're going to get every single year, but a very consistent course history over the first two seasons and on top of that a lot of the same types of players that are popping up here so I think from the modeling perspective it get, presents quite a solid opportunity for those that are willing to put in the work this week because we kind of know what we're looking for at this certain golf tournament and because it's not the strongest field there's going to be a lot of those 7-8k plays that are going to be really useful out there for showdown and for DFS and from the outright perspective I think some 50 to 100, maybe even 150 to 1 type of winners that you might be able to take at this kind of golf course. So I like the modeling here. It's a much more of a ball striking test than what you'd expect at most of these type of venues. And a few things to hone in on here. First off, the fairway percentage is higher than your tour average. You would expect that with the wide open fairways that we have. But the green regulation percentage, even though we have pretty massive landing areas out there, is right about your tour average. And that is despite not having a whole lot of trouble off the tee. I'm talking about rough that's only about an inch, inch and a half long. Water hazards are present on a few holes out there, but it's not like you're hitting into the desert all the time. It's not like there's water on every single hole. So the fact that we have a relatively high fairway percentage, but a low green and regulation percentage at a resort style golf course like this um, is again, just shows you how long it is, right? It's not so much that the targets are small out there. It's that it's a 7,500 yard golf course. And in fact, I know we don't have the approach distributions on here. If you take a look at where a lot of the iron shots are coming from, it's from 150 yards and plus. And in fact, we do have a little bit of the distribution down here, but look how many of them are coming from 175 to 225. I mean, it is a much higher than what we're used to seeing here. So we don't have the other ranges for a typical tour course on here, but you're getting almost double the golf shots 
out here from 175 to 225. 125 to 175, you can see is probably about tour average um, out there with that metric. But a lot of the shots in this range are coming from 150 to 175. So in general, you're going to have more long iron shots around Vedanta Vallarta uh, compared to some of your other tour courses out there. You can see is also a ton of bombers. Um, that are doing well here because it's a bomber's paradise. In fact, in terms of its rating off the tee, um, whether it's suited towards longer or shorter players, it is a 9 out of 10 bomber's paradise. So this is something that Bet the Number, of course, um, uses as one of their proprietary models um, and tells you that when you hit driver around Vedanta Vallarta, that you're going to see a huge advantage compared to hitting it shorter. And in fact, about 2.3 shots gained per round with the bomb opportunity, which is uh, by far the highest that we We've seen right and you can see that the penalty for being short is over an entire stroke per round um, you're going to see a lot of separation with the driver this week and some of those long irons like we were mentioning before the uh, round of the green distribution uh, looks pretty typical. I don't see that many outliers there. Uh, your putting stats look pretty typical as well. Um, not all that many outlier distributions when it comes to the putts that you're hitting um, or the putts that are going down. It's more so a separator with the ball striking, which again, for a resort style golf course, right? One that is meant for you and me, right? Meant for people that aren't quite as skilled as golf, right? As some of these tour pros out here. A lot of times we see an extremely high fairway exchange extremely high green regulation percentage, but that's not really the case here, right? They've got all those different tee boxes to work with, all those different pin locations that they can use to trip up players. And uh, it plays like a pretty average tour course. I mean, even the bogeys per round average, right? is just marginally lower than what we're used to seeing. Your birdies per round average, sure, is higher than what you're used to seeing on the PGA Tour, but it's not outrageously higher, right? It's just 3.95 birdies per round. So um, this is a course that I think a lot of people, when they first hear about this resort-style golf course, um, expect it to play a lot differently than it does. It's a lot more traditional than I think a lot of people out there expect. And with our modeling, it reflects that, right? We're looking for a pretty average sort of player, right? Somebody that can, you know, you put in contributions from all the different shots gained categories, but off the tee, that distance is huge with the Bombers Paradise. Uh, and then some of that long iron play is something to lean into. All right, now let's quickly go hole by hole. So first off, hole number one, not the handshake that many players would hope for. So you've got water down the right, you've got some trees, the little natural area down the left. And though you do have quite a large fairway, if you miss, you're going to be penalized for it. So it gives a good idea of what to expect around Vedanta, which is large landing areas, but huge misses if you do not hit it in the right position. Hole two is 487. This is a longer par four, a little natural area down the left side. And once again, a little bit, I would say, unclear, a little bit blurry out there with these overhead views. But if you miss to the left, you're screwed in that natural area. And if you miss to the right, you've got some little bushes and shrubs over there as well. So it is a resort style golf course. You can see that right around the green, especially, right? Not that much to get you into trouble, but not the largest greens in human history, right? I mean, these aren't St. Andrews type greens. They're certainly not Pebble Beach small either but uh much harder than most of your resort courses three is 449 dog leg from right to left the longer you are the more that you can cut off here and a uh, pretty hard angle to hit this fairway here it's uh not the easiest fairway oh four is 526 uh, this will be a par four. So it's listed as a par five. This is a par 73 for its resort members, um, par 71 for your elite level tour pros. Uh, so this will be a par four when it's all said and done. Hole five is 209 yards. So longer par three. Um, the water is really non play unless you hit a horrible tee shot. Um, more so just a long iron in. Hole six is 608 yards. This is a par five, right? Not going to be shorn to a par four. <laughs> it's something over 600 yards. But uh, yeah, a longer par five for these players to attack. Hole seven is a drivable par four. It is 309 yards. Uh, will be drivable for pretty much the entire week. But because it is slightly over 300 yards, not every single player is going to go for it. So a little bit of a decision to be made. But for your elite tier players, a birdie opportunity for sure. Hole 8 is 505 yards. You have a dog leg from left to right, tee shot that can be real difficult because of the water hazard to the right side. And uh, another hole you're just hoping to make par on because it is that lengthy. Hole 9 is 179, so your next par 3 on the front side. A uh, little bit of an island nature to it uh, with the water hazard surrounding. But once again, unless you hit a horrible tee shot, uh, you're probably not in that water. 
You're starting on the back nine. You start with an extremely difficult hole. In fact, probably the hardest tee shot on property. You've got these little dunes to the left, a little bit of undulation towards the left side in this cart path. Um, also water to the right. So it's a long tee shot. It's hard to even carry it into the fairway here um, when it's playing directly into the breeze and uh, much harder than starting at hole number one. Next up, you got 187 yard par three, water to the right side. So a little bit more in play when it comes to a penalty shot. Um, as opposed to the first through par threes uh, where you really had to hit it offline to hit it in the water, but uh, still shorter. So it's not quite as hard as the first two. Hole 12 is a par five, 654. This one is extremely hard to reach in two, but uh, definitely still a birdie look for those reaching in three. 13 is 170 yards. So your next par three, this one does not have water in play. Hole 14 is 572. This is a par five, so it's not shortened. And uh, let's go back so you can see the second shot here. It's reachable in two, does have some water in play, uh, which gives it a little bit of that risk reward aspect in terms of going forward in two, uh, but definitely a birdie look. 15 is 462, mid-length par four. You do have water down the left side, uh, so try and avoid that. 16 is a converted par four, so this won't be a par five like it says overhead. So it'll play a little bit shorter, might play a little bit easier than what it looks from the overhead view, but any converted par five into a four is going to be a pretty hard par. 17 is 221, it's your last par three. You do have water in play on this one, um, unlike the last one that we went through, and uh, it's a long par three over water. It's pretty tough. And finally, hole 18 is a finishing par five. This one is 543 yards. If you don't miss in this left bunker like Tony Finau did, you're likely gonna have a go at two here. And because it's only about 540 yards, most players are gonna be able to get it around the green in two, uh, making it a pretty solid birdie look. Now that you've seen the golf course here a little bit, let's go through the modeling over here on Bet the Number. So as we were saying earlier, this golf course is a little bit more ball striking heavy than you'd expect for most resort style courses. And you see that reflected with the BTN model. So first off, let's look at some of the stat categories and then take a look at who they really like this week. And the one category that I'm behind this week that uh, was number one in my model, and I'm glad that they have it on here is ball speed. This is a longer course, whether it's with your irons or your off the tee play, there is a huge advantage to being a bomber. So guys like Chris Goddard right towards the top of that list. You got Jake Knapp up there, Toasty, um, Bramlett, of course, is an absolute striper, Callum Turan, Johnny Vegas, um, Tony Finau, right, winner and of course runner-up finish a few years ago, um, up there in the top 10. These ball striking bomber just long type of players are all going to be at the top of my list this week so something to keep an eye on something to include in your modeling whether it's ball speed whether it's driving distance shots gained off the tee a few different ways that you can look at these power players they're all guys that are going to get a slight bump in my modeling and uh, you'll see that reflected with my projections later Next up, something I like that BTN is doing here is looking at the longer approaches, whether it's your par threes, a lot of your par fours that are demanding long iron approaches. Uh, you want to take a look at the guys that are better with the long irons. So first off, just sorting by that, they've got Joe Highsmith up there. Guys like Keith Mitchell that are specialists with the long irons, JJ Spawn Popping, Eric Van Royen, Austin Eckroat, a few names to keep an eye on there. Taylor Pendrith popping um, in a second category, was up there with the ball speed as well. You had Vincent Norman on ball speed, also showing up with some of the longer irons. Um, you had Dylan Wu, Brandon Wu up here. Brandon Wu has an excellent track record um, around Vedanta Vallarta. In fact, two top three finishes in a row is really popping from that 175 plus range. So that's something that I'm including in my modeling. I like to see that over here in BTN as well. And then something I want to point out are just the regular approach poppers. So in general, I think this is more of a ball striking course than what most people expect. So if we're just looking at an approach play over the last 40 or so rounds, we've got Tony Fino up there, EVR, Chesson Hadley, Mark Hubbard, who's been playing some sneaky good golf over the last month or so. You got Justin Lauer, Davis Thompson, another player that's pretty long off the tee that uh, might be worth a few looks at this sort of golf tournament. Ches Reevy, JJ Spawn showing up once again, right? Somebody that was showing up with the long irons, maybe not playing as well of late, but has at least been hitting his irons pretty well. You got Nikolai Hogard there, Brandon Wu showing up once again with that elite course history, Robert McIntyre, Callum Turan, 
another long iron player that is also an elite level um, ball speed type of player um, are all guys that are at least catching some of my attention there. And then number one thing, when, th another thing I want to look at, right, is just off the tee, right? So we were looking at ball speed. We were looking at some of like the driving distance um, stuff before, but who's putting it together with both your accuracy and your distance as there are a few water hazards and spots of bother around Vedanta Vallarta. Well, we've got Johnny Vegas up there, MJ Daffy, who have, we haven't really seen for quite some time. That's at least a little bit interesting there. Cameron Champ with a pretty good course history, two top eight finishes himself. Alejandro Tosti, who finished in 10th year last year, probably worth a few looks there as well. Tosti was also showing up with some of the ball speed numbers before. Keith Mitchell, of course, playing really good off the tee, has that elite distance and that elite tier accuracy. Also was showing up with some of the long irons um, are players that I'm expecting to pop up in my models as well. So in terms of what BTN is looking at, if we go ahead and put all of that together, you'll see that guys like Taylor Pendrith are at the top of their list, who's what, $9,600, you love that. EV Art, $9,500 is number two in their model. Steven Yeager up there with some of the long irons. Nikolai Hogard, long and really good with the long irons. Um, not a surprise to see him up there. Keith Mitchell, same thing. Um, Michael Kim, maybe a little bit surprising for me, but um, you gotta like a lot of the dark green that you're seeing for Michael Kim there. Also finished in T. 30 last year. Um, guys like Hayden Springer, probably a small sample guy, but also a player that's popping. Tony Finau, of course, with his elite level course history. Ekrot, where we mentioned his name a few times. Um, look at that, right? T49. Maybe not the best course history, but it did at least make the cut here. Um, Thomas Dietrich, Johnny Vegas, Davis Thompson showing up in the BTN model. I love that. Um, Miliano Grillo also has pretty good course history here, right? T5 last year, uh, like that he's showing up in the model. Grayson Sig, you got Nate Lashley, Carl Juan, I think is somebody to keep an eye on as well. Made the cut here last year, also popping in the BTN model. Um, a lot of the kind of guys you'd expect to see, right? A lot of bombers here, a lot of really good approach players, uh, which is kind of what I'm looking for. And I imagine when I run my model later this evening, it's going to be a lot of these same um, types of players, right? They're elite, either elite level bombers, like what we have with like Keith Mitchell, Nikolai Hogard, um, or just elite level long iron players, um, like what we have here with the Steven Yeager. So it's a week where we kind of know what to expect. I know we've only seen this golf course twice, um, so usually it's kind of hard to say that. But with how consistent, right, the leaderboards have been, it's been all like the same type of players that are showing up. I feel pretty confident about what we're, where we're at here with 2024 in the Mexico Open, about trying to find some of these players um, and leaning into the key stats that we have in the model here. And now for some of our comps, which for this week, I don't think are the best. I don't think we have a lot of good comps for what to expect at Vedanta, but we do have the Worldwide Technology Championship, which was played at El Cardinal, another resort style golf course, wide open off the tee. It was a Tiger Woods design that I mentioned before. You can look out for a little bit of crossover. Um, we do only have the one year sample size to work with. So it's not like we have a ton of data, but it's similar in the, in the way that it's you know wide open off the tee. You're not really gonna be penalized for a lot of your misses, at least not nearly as much as compared to like what we had at the Genesis. So you can take a look at that. I also would say um, the Country Club of Jackson, so that would be the home of the Sanderson Farms, would also pre be a pretty decent comp that you could look at. Uh, it's just going to be hard to find it on here, so let's find it. Uh, the Sanderson Farms Championship. So that's another relatively long course. It's a par 72, but what I like about it is that it kind of emphasizes the same type of players, right? It's a lot of your ball strikers that play well there. Um, you don't have to putt very well to have a good week at the Sanderson Farms. As you saw with Sergio Garcia winning there, I mean, Luke List winning this event um, actually did putt pretty well when he ended up winning it this last year. But uh, in general, you look at the leaderboard, a lot of really strong drivers up there. So I think Country Club of Jackson would make a little bit of sense there. Um, a lot of these fall series events where they emphasize the driving are the types of events that I would be looking at. So, of course, you had the resort style event with what you had in Mexico. I think that you can look at that. The Sanderson Farms would make a little bit of sense there, too. But outside of that, not a lot of comps that I like. Like I said, it's not the best week for it. If we were going to find another one, you could take a look at um, Mayakoba, which was the home of the Worldwide Technology Championship a few years ago. So if we go back to 2022... 
We end up finding that golf course. I think you could use that for a little bit of crossover. Um, Corrales Putacana, actually want to mention that one as well. Um, that's the home of the Corrales Golf Ch Championship. It's in Dominican Republic. Um, this is a long golf course, right? So it's nearly 7,700 yards. Par 72 is a par opposed to a par 71, but another weaker field event where you're wide open off the tee. It's made defenses the length of the golf course. It's some of the long iron shots that you're hitting. Um, in terms of actual playability, this is probably the number one comp course on tour. But the issue is, of course, that we have no shots gained metrics from this event. It's also a alternate field event, so it's even weaker than what we're going to get for this week. You could take a look at that a little bit. It's just, uh, again, not the best week for comps, right? Vedanta is a pretty unique golf course. It's a unique field in the fact that you're not getting all your top end players. And it's usually hard to find something that can compare to that. So we went over a few here. I would say my number one, right, obviously would be that DeMonte course. Um, unfortunately, we've only seen it once. Number two, probably Corrales, just because we've seen it a little bit more than the rest. Sanderson Farms, I think, is okay. You know, a few others that you could probably throw in the mix as well. Uh, but yeah, the comps for this week, maybe not as strong as what they are for most out here in tour. That is all I've got for this week's course preview. Hopefully you feel a little bit more prepared to go out there and get your research process started. Smash that like button on the way out of here for me and also comment down below what you've got as your winning score. If you can go ahead, get it right, you'll get a free month of my Patreon page, which is of course where I'm posting all my projections, both for DFS, betting, and for props, and where you can get all of that direct access yourself to get your research process started. So if you want a chance to earn a free month of that, go ahead. Give me your best guess down below for that winning score. And if you end up getting that right, I'll get you hooked up with that free month. Appreciate the support here, guys. Best of luck with all your exposure this week, whether it's for props, outrights, DFS, whatever the case is. Best of luck out there with whatever you're doing. And let's go out there and have ourselves a week for the Mexico Open. Mm -hmm.